the Buddha's name was Siddhartha Gautama. Um, he was born a wealthy prince in India in around 563 before co the Common Era. Um, BC, the BCE, by the way, just a quick footnote, is kind of the new BC. Mm -hmm. B like by the time I was in religious studies school, they had got they had gotten rid of BC, like before Christ and AD, mm -hmm. Anno Domini, or Year of the, Year of Our Lord. It gets very Christian centric, and so what they did. Uh, within the past few decades is it's before common era is BCE, mm -hmm. formerly BC, and then CE is common era, which is, I think I'm, I'm with the uh, <laughs> uh, non-Christian institution yeah. view of that, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Puritan Christian fathers <laughs> of America. We've They're, left your... <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> They still got the Gregorian calendar, right? So, mm -mm -mm. But mm -mm. it's just we're <laughs> taking the acronyms back. So anyway, mm -hmm. 563 before Common Era, um, and and the Buddha as a boy, as a little kid, and really his kind of young life, he was sheltered from the world. Um, his his father was a king, and he consulted a priest who um, kind of did a Vedic astrology read on his son's birth, and he said he would be one of two things he's either going to be a great warrior king known for his conquests or he's going to be a famous saint known for his teachings and the king did not want to lose his heir to the monastic life so he said i want the king one because i get to choose what my son's <laughs> going to do mm -hmm. and um and so he just sheltered him his whole life he stayed in the castle grounds and um at some point, Prince Siddhartha grew tired of being confined to the palace grounds. He convinced the charioteer to take him out into the city in the mid-20s, basically. And um, there he saw what became known as the Four Sights. Uh, first, he saw an old man, which made him know aging. He didn't know what that was before. Um, and then a sick man, illness. And then a dead man, showing him mortality and impermanence. And then the fourth site was a monk, uh, you know, Hindu monk, uh, as kind of a potential of, of a way out of the other three. And so kind of spiritual practice in an attempt to end the suffering. You know, I, you can only imagine the kind of, kind of conscious evolution that would take forth from getting those four and already being kind of a contemplative person. Um, and so he, you know, he ultimately left. He, 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 kind of escaped the palace and he became an extreme ascetic uh, in the, in the early, I think it was a couple of years actually in his early years of um, uh, kind of trying to find the answer to beating the first three sites. And um, he almost died. He, he went kind of, he went hard into prolonged fasting and like ate like a grain of rice a day kind of thing. And, um, he basically realized this isn't it. That's not the answer. I'm, I'm too weak to meditate and think. And um, he, um, you know, that was an important realization to have. And then he famously sat under this kind of tree called the Bodhi tree and reached enlightenment. He sat for, um, I believe it was 40 days. And um, I, that feels kind of mythical. So I'm not going <laughs> to. And it's also strangely very like, in line with Abrahamic traditions, the 40 yeah. days aspect, but, yeah, um, <laughs> but, um, anywho, he resolved the main piece there was he resolved to not move from the spot until reaching it. And he just had this like kind of firm determination was tempted by Mara, similar to kind of Christ tempted by Satan cough, cough. And then, <laughs> um, you know, he he came into this awakening. The Buddha translation is the awakened one. And um, so his kind of foundational precepts, his foundational teachings are called the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And those those are kind of the, um, you know, core teachings of uh, what he was getting get, got across. He had a long period of life, actually, many decades of teaching after the fact, which uh, Jesus didn't. Jesus only had a few years, um, but um, 
but yeah, basically the, the four noble truths, what are they? The first, the first truth is this world is suffering, which I think a lot of people, as you get older, realize that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, essentially what he, his prescription is that desire creates suffering. Um, our, our desire or our attachments sometimes is translated as clinging, clinging to external kind of ambitions um, or what create that suffering, that sense of, um, it's called dukkha, which means like unsatisfactoriness, basically, of suffering or unsatisfactoriness. That unsatisfactoriness of the human condition is, is what uh, kind of sustains uh, the whole thing. And so the third noble truth is ceasing desire ceases suffering. Um, easier said than done, obviously. You know, that's a nice theory. Um, but it takes a lot of kind of incremental progress and incremental work to kind of break down those desires and, and that attachment uh, to our ambitions, to the external stimuli in the world. And uh, essentially the, four, the fourth noble truth is basically the, the idea that this eightfold path thing, uh, ethical living, is what aids the cessation of desire. That's what aids the third noble truth. So, so the eightfold path is kind of this prescription for how to uh, best set yourself up to um, be able to cease those desires. If you're not doing the eightfold path, it's going to be even harder to do that. So that's pretty much it. We can <laughs> clock out now. <laughs> all right. See y'all. See y'all next week. <laughs> see ya. <clears throat> but you know, the f four noble truths is kind of like the beatitudes for G for Jesus. You know, it's like yeah. If you want to understand this one, uh, very Buddhism one hundred and one, um, you talk about that one. And um, I think there's a there's a book I'm getting through i'm not quite done yet but um it's just called why buddhism is true um super cool book um by by this guy robert wright who's a professor and um he you know essentially in line with the mindfulness and in line with the secularization of buddhism um talks a lot about how you know, stripped away from, now there are like astral components because there, there's reincarnation, uh, although there's anatta, which is non-self. We'll get into the metaphysics too, but just from a psychological standpoint, um, you know, essentially what, what Robert Wright and what many kind of Buddhist scholars talk about is that like the Four Noble Truths, like that lines up with modern psychology. That lines up with, um, like he's an, uh, Robert Wright was an evolutionary psychologist. He wrote The Moral Animal is his kind of um, first biggest book. And, um, you know, kind of how essentially how natural selection is all based on gene spreading and that we kind of have, uh, you know, it's we delude ourselves, our, our system. Uh, natural selection de deludes our minds um, in order to spread genes. And, um, you know, essentially his point in the book is like what Buddhism does is it, is it helps us become free of that. It helps us um, kind of notice these delusions for what they are as kind of a false cause and effect system mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, allow them to dissipate. Now, of course, there's reincarnation involved because Buddhism, I'd say the ultimate end goal of Buddhism is nirvana, which is kind of breaking the chains of birth and death, similar to um, Hinduism, um, which is breaking samsara. It's also called the wheel, wheel of birth and death. Um, but, but there are distinctions, uh, which we can talk about, or you guys can also jump in. I feel like I'm <laughs> going on and on like usual. It is kind of amazing how modern buddhism feels um to me it just the, i guess the focus on mind training and and maybe the de-emphasis of the of like metaphysics uh, or, or any um supernatural although there are you know it's not that it's totally devoid of of supernatural um stories or like i remember the um one of the things i remember about his story is 
after him going through a lot of his trials and everything, he was sitting at the river and decided or, or um, you know, said, if, if I'm on the right path, let this bowl flow in the opposite direction of the river. And and he put a bowl in the river and it, it like moved against the 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 stream. Um, so like I remember a few. Um, mm. But but yeah, it, overall, though, it feels very like you said, it, it lines up with with um you know kind of modern psychology and that's always fascinated me and i imagine is why it's um it's, you know a, a popular thing these days i feel like most people have are yeah kind of like po- post enlightenment like, era yeah yeah and, and 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 i feel like a lot of people are familiar like with rational kind of basic thoughts tenets. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah i've never heard anyone say buddhism made me worse <laughs> true i mean you know i i will caveat that to say that um i think we did this other episode that may or may not be published ever but um mm-hmm. it was kind of me like i think it was just again me like talking for 90 minutes at you guys maybe is why it will, <laughs> it'll stay unpublished for a while but um one of, one of those points i was like so uh passionate about sharing was like there's good and bad in every religion. I think Buddhism as a whole, you know, people who take it up are going to be improve themselves. But just, just to point out, there are terrible Buddhists, um, particularly militant Buddhists um, who are involved in the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar um, over the past few years who killed Muslim uh, refugees, um, which is, that's not an indictment of Buddhism. That's an indictment of kind of, the, the human condition and um you know i would argue like the ego and like our our tendency to um kind of mess up a good thing you know we're real good at that um but to your so i just want to asterisk that comment totally right? but you, yeah you, but you're right i mean i think i think in general especially kind of post-christian america where where you know that's kind of a lot of who we're speaking to um, in the Beware How Project and through my caffeinated uh, writing and uh, dialogue with you guys, um, <laughs> you know, that's kind of who we're trying to connect with is people that are looking for some some way out of their despair or their, um, you know, kind of unsatisfactoriness. Robert Wright said in this book, he's, he's pretty funny too. It's really, I'm really enjoying it. And he said... Um, he said the Stones uh, song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, is, um, according to Buddhism, the human condition. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's good. Yeah. you know, that, that liberation of, of getting out of that just inherent tendency of human you know, suffering is, is worthwhile. It's a worthwhile pursuit. Yeah, I think I saw, I watched that, uh, one of the videos you shared of his interview, and I liked his um just kind of reminder that that evolutionarily we're designed to um to desire because we need to acquire things to stay alive but that that hardwiring um almost inevitably leads to suffering because it's it's um it's designed to keep us alive but not necessarily designed to keep us like happy and content all the time because if we get happy and content then we sit down and relax and and we die in the evolutionary uh view of it so um it it's this this framework is uh it was it was a way to address that that disconnect between the way we were designed and the way that and and what would make us uh like content on a on a in a more um, profound way, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think what's so cool too about Buddhism and, and what he taught is, is the flipping and the kind of like similar to like some of Christ's parables. I mean, again, from a comparative religion piece, like, like, um, you know, how, how, how radical a teaching something like love your enemies is from Mm -hmm. Jesus. Um, You know, Buddha kind of has all these kinds of similar kind of flips. Like there's this great scene um, early on in his teaching career where uh, a local governor 
figure kind of asks him to help him rule. I think he was just listening in and was kind of like, hey, we need guys like you kind of, <laughs> you know, he's like a, a HR department at a corporation or something. And, <laughs> you know, uh, this is, you're the kind of person we need. And, and Buddha says, um, I have severed all ties because I seek deliverance. How is it possible for me to return to the world? Will a fish that has been baited still covet the hook or an escaped bird love the net? Would a man who has burned his hand with a torch take up the torch after he dropped it to the earth? <laughs> Not that interested in your what you're offering here. Man. I don't want to go back into the prison mm-hmm. from which I've escaped. It's great. Yeah, um, I read this one to you guys a, a couple weeks ago, but I have to share it again. Uh, this is very Christ-like. Um, a foolish man learning that Buddha observed the principle of great love, which commends to return good for evil, came and abused him. Buddha was silent, pitying his folly. The man having finished his abuse, Buddha asked him, saying, Son, if a man declined to accept a present made to him, to whom would it belong? And he answered, In that case, it would belong to the man who offered it. My son, said Buddha, you have railed at me but I decline to accept your abuse and request you keep it to yourself. Will it not be a source of misery to you? The abuser made no reply, and Buddha continued, A wicked man who reproaches a virtuous one is like one who looks up and spits at heaven. The spittle soils not heaven, but comes back and defiles his own person. <laughs> so just sick burns. <laughs> but not... You know, emotional criticism, more just up-leveling. 